sitting in England and you hear Jane's Addiction, it all makes sense to you because it sounds like they've got a bass player who listened to The Cure and Joy Division and New Order. But then you had like a rock guitar player who wanted to shred all the time. Right. And then you had a drummer that just wanted to be nutty and creative. Yes. Yeah. With a singer that was almost like doing poetry over the top. Everything that was wrong about this band is what made them right. Yeah. That's what I, I got. It. I, I'd seen uh, Jane's Addiction play a bunch of times before I worked with them. Um, I, I'd worked with X, and they were backing up X, and I saw a bunch of shows with X and Jane's Addiction. And I tell you the truth, Jane's Addiction didn't do anything for me. You know, they, in fact, the, the audience response where I saw them play a few times with uh, X wasn't, like, great. However, uh, one night I was driving back from San Diego. I checked, I'd been checking out a band play live at the university down there. I just uh, finished an album with. And um, uh, I drove by. I knew that they were playing at this place downtown, this uh, old hotel. And uh, I was just going to drive by and see what was going on or whatever. I drove there. Was like it, This is 3 o'clock in the morning. And I understand there was over 3,000 people trying to get into this ballroom. And it was a creepy old ballroom, it like something from a you know movie from 1917 or something. And um, I went in and um, I said hi to the band. Then I went back. I always sit by where the sound man is. That's where you're going to get the best sound. Sat down and they came out. Oh my God, they were great. There was like a couple other bands in my whole life that sent uh, hairs up by through my spine. Uh, in my whole life, like one was Jimi Hendrix at the Hollywood Bowl, and they came out and they killed it. They were so awesome, and I, that's when I decided I really wanted to do it. You know, after up to that, it was kind of like, eh, I don't know. but because um, uh, I've seen a lot of bands come through that, that over the years, they had a lot of hype and they just didn't deliver. But I thought if I could get some of that on tape, just a touch of that, it's it's going to go. Well, let's so let's get to that. Let's listen back to some of these tracks. Okay, so you were just telling me. What was it? You said everything starts with Eric Avery's bass. Always. Uh, every, every, everything, every song was built around Eric. And, and by the way, this was on a tape. I got a tape from Jane's Addiction before I did the, this record. Um, and No, this is off the second record. Before I did the first record, uh, I got a tape and had everything that they I had re uh, rehearsed for. And it had 18 songs on it. And how I did the two albums is we picked nine off that tape, and that was one album, and the nine left over was the second album. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it was that. Yeah, I mean, it was it was that. Uh, it's almost crude, you know. But I spent a whole summer with that tape. I, I had a place out in uh, Chatsworth at the time, and had one of the big fire pits out in the backyard, and I listened to the tape over and over and over again all summer, just me, me and the tape and the stars, and it really went to my soul. It was. And ha having seen them live, what they were capable of live, what was on that tape, you know, I, I, now I really wanted to do the record, so. That's amazing. Well, let's listen to Eric's bass. Yeah, Eric is good. Yeah, he always lays down a good groove. This is uh, the, the sound on this. There's a guy named Dan Schwartz who's an audiophile. He writes for these high-end uh, mag audiophile magazines. That was his uh, um, amp. It's, it's actually a, Dan Schwartz, the bass player. I know Dan. Yeah. Okay. Dan Schwartz, the bass player. Yeah. That's actually a uh, preamp and amp for a high-end stereo. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, we tried to. Um, he brought it by and we tried it out and then he took it home and then we tried to replicate that with everything else and couldn't do it. So <laughs> he, so he brought it back and we used it. I remember I had an 18 inch, I, well, I had two systems, right? I had uh, like 12 inch and 18 inch. Right. And uh, uh, we would use the, uh, primarily the 12 inch because the 18 inch is so much. Fun. How, how you mic the, uh, you have to mic the 18 inch. Right. To get to get the set, uh, where the sound wave starts to develop, which is around 14 feet. Right. If you put it up to the speaker, all you're going to get is that picking sound. Right. But if you put it away, the waveform develops. Yeah. And it takes, uh, like for an E string, for instance, on a bass, a low E, standard low E is 14 feet. Right. So, I mean. So you had a mic a long way back. Yeah. I mean, recording, recording when you break it down, uh, 
in, into the physics of it and look at it, it's very simple. Sound is not a complicated thing, as, as opposed to like light, which is right. a very complicated thing. Right. But um, I mean, the fact that we can build machines that go over the speed of sound, but we'll never build anything that goes the speed of light. You know, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you can see the difference, how, how crude it seems. You know, this bass sound is phenomenal. And you're right, his groove is insane. Yeah. And he's like, a, he's like a one-take guy. He's not like a guy that you punch in. He plays it all the way through. Boom. It, it was always the thing that struck me um, when I first heard Jones Edition was, was the bass playing. So I want to listen to this drum track because this is one of the most insanely good drum tracks I think ever. Well, you know what I like to say about this? Um, he couldn't get the groove on this. Right. It's... Uh, um, it's it's like a compound time. It's more like that, but not quite. That's a triplet. But he wasn't getting in the groove, and then so Dave Navarro on unplugged in guitar, so there's not this huge sound, not yep. not not like regular acoustic. He played the groove, right? And I did like six passes of that on different unplugged in guitars, and put that in uh, his headphones, and he got the right. groove. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, there's a looseness to it, which is insanely good. Which makes it good. Yeah. He's almost pushing against, pushing against the bass. It's so good. What are the mics you use on the drums? Okay, I did, on the kick drum, a D, uh, D12, D112. D112, okay. Um, what is that, AKG? Yep. And then uh, <clears throat> I uh, the snare, I use a um, 57 on the top and a 57 on the bottom. And right. they're like looking at each other. So so the phase, you always know where your phase is. Um, phase is very important. And then, did you have an outside mic on the kick as well? Yes, actually, I did start using uh, one uh, about um, if the room would, it was either 14 feet or 7 feet. It was either half a cycle or a full cycle out, so you get the full thing. And that, usually I would use a good condenser mic. Right. And then I stole your hi-hat trick, which I always name check, which is the double mic, mm -hmm. which is a small diaphragm condenser taped together with a 57. Right. I stole it from you, use it to this day. <laughs> that works for you. Yeah, all my all my stuff I use is pretty standard. That way, I always have a baseline. You know, right. if, if it's not meeting up to my expectations, then either it's me or something else. But it's not not the the drum setup. Right. You know, I <clears throat> I believe me, I've tried every mic in every combination of mic and number of mic, and it's all boiled down to this. This isn't just haphazard. Um, all these mics that I'm mentioning uh, work really well with drums. You know. What yeah. about the toms? What did you go for? I, the toms? Top and bottom uh, 421s. 421s. Sennheiser. They were, it, for some reason, they get that bite when they hit, you know, in the bottom mic. And another thing, now, this is where the phase thing comes You know, if you, you don't want to have the snare being picked up by the tom, right? So the 9 dB rule, I'm going to want to have separation. I want when he hits the snare, there's going to be 9 dB down on the VU meter coming up on this mic, right? Yep. And how you do this is I take two 421s and right on the edge of the rim, I have them looking at each other. Right. And that way I can have control of the phase. The one can be 180 degrees out of the other. That'll, that'll put it back in phrase. The, this bottom mic will be 180 degrees out from this mic. What I found when I, because I learned that from you. So what I found by doing that was it actually was a blessing because it gives you cancellation right. of bleed. Yeah. Yeah. It's just something that's really, really important. That's when you double mic like that, you get this sort of, because as soon as you get the tom, the polarity right, the phase right, you flip that bow and there's an actual little, you think you're going to get more bleed, you actually get a little less. You get less. I mean, again, these mics and all this is, is after years of trying everything i i had the belief that there there could be one 
you know, gold standard of miking that would, you could use every time. And then if there's a variance, it has to do with the drums. That's the thing that if it doesn't sound right, it's the drums. It's not my mics or my miking technique. These are bulletproof and right. they work every time. And if I get put up the mics and start listening to the drums and the it's drums sound terrible, I trust my miking now. I might even I might even do this um, if I want to go for exotic miking. Now I sometimes I spread out and use ribbon mics and whatever you know, but I'll start with the drum sound with this setup that I'm talking about because then I know if it sounds solid with this sound, then I can trust my drums. You know the tight. I remember and, when I was working with you, you really loved 121s, the Royers for overheads. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. Use. I mean, there's the overheads. Of, I mean, my favorite overheads. I used to have C12s, these big long things. Yeah. And those things just sound so good. They had overtones on them, are so sweet. You know, just the air of them and everything. But um, uh, the Royers are ribbon mics, and the ribbon mics. Actually, ribbon mics were developed before uh, condenser mics came in. It, they were trying to get uh, manufacturers of mics were trying to get a more delicate sound and so they were using really thin pieces of like you know, like aluminum foil to sing into instead of a di big diaphragm you're trying to push around so then uh they went out of style for a while except in for miking horns uh there's a rca mic uh ribbon mic that's a good gold standard rca 44 that's like a standard mic that you'll find in any big studio for miking uh horns but um but get back to my uh, miking technique and trusting and all that, I might, even though I plan on using other mics in the end to try them, I will always start off with the setup that I'm telling you. And if it sounds right, then I can add a mic in, you know, and if that sounds wrong, then I trust my gold standard of mic, you know what I'm saying? Um, I just, you know, you don't know where your head's going to be like when you walk into a studio you might think you know but you don't i'm telling you you have to have um place uh, places that you stand for reference that you can swear that it's right even though it doesn't sound right you know what i mean i, I don't know how to describe it but this miking technique always works you know these the the 421 is top and bottom the d112 on the kick drum and then maybe another mic out seven or 14 feet uh, for um, you know the, the, the bottom of the you know cycle of the 60 cycles and then uh, for cymbals um, it may vary but uh, my favorite all-time um, cymbal mic were these C12s and then actually the AKG 414 was designed with the same type capsule so you can go there or um, you know uh, some people, how I do it is I close my cymbals. Let me just get to the point. When, right. when he's playing loud or soft, I, you, I do it over the bell and I'm over, I'm less, less than a foot from the cymbal. And then to catch, use the right mic and you're going to catch that air on top. It's, you're going to hear it. But the, uh, you know, these, these, I see people, number one thing I see people do is on the overhead cymbals, they put them mics like 10 feet over the thing. It's like, what are you doing? If you do that, why don't you just play with uh, one bongo, one cardboard box, <laughs> and one and one and one cymbal? <laughs> Next thing be your drum sound. <laughs> There's no separation. The the thing is way too far away for what it was designed to pick up for, you know. Right. So I people do the craziest things, and then they'll give me all these. Uh, answers i'll say why, why did you suggest that and they said well i was reading this thing in the internet and i said stop <laughs> i said you can read all you want or you can listen to guys like me all you want but unless you actually get and do Gonna it do yourself it. you do it yourself you had that's how you're going to learn you're going to be but what's good to lose the mics yourself and find yeah, out yeah it's good to listen to guys like me to have a starting point you know, I mean, my thing about close micing the drums, mm -hmm. all over the drums, toms, top and bottom, cymbals and all that. I mean, the, and for the mics that I'm describing, for me, are gold standards. And I don't think there's any engineer out there really is going to argue with this either. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty basic and standard. But if you want to then experiment and have a high mic over the snare, which is good for like in a room that has some... Uh, ambience. ambience and stuff. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of things you could do. And the, other th the last thing I'm going to say on room miking. Room miking, 
I've heard I, there was this guy that was developing this program. Uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but he had a, a software program and it was supposed to do drums, right? It was one of the first programs that came out. It sounded like real drums, and he. This guy thought he knew everything, right? So I heard his program when it came out. First thing I heard, I put up his uh, room tracks, stereo room tracks, two tracks, and the kick is coming out of the left side. How many times have you seen that? The guy's listening to the whole drum sound and determined that it's all okay, but when you solo up the, the room mics, which is picking up everything, it, they're picking up over here. I'm telling you something with mics. Your eyes are not microphones. Your eyes are not, my dad drilled that into me when I was about eight years old. Your eyes are not microphones. Your ears are the only way to judge that, and the only way to judge it is record it and listen to it. Don't stand in the room, that's the first thing you can do, but record it and see what it sounds like. And what I do with room mics is, I take two mics, put them side by side, away from it. They'll always pick the kick drum up in the center. They pick up the whole sound of the room. The mics don't know that they're sitting over here. They don't have eyes. <laughs> Try it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a, a good idea that I had one time. It, was, uh, it works if you're going to take the time. You get these plate mics, right? And you tape them onto a basketball, two basketballs. And you put one randomly anywhere in the room and then have your engineer second walk around with the other one, and he'll tell you where the perfect, you'll hear the perfect spot. Two plate mics, two basketballs, and you got, there are two heads you got, and you just got one ear, yeah. and, and that, that, that's... Do you, you mean like a boundary mic? Like boundary a, mic, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. A plate mic, yeah. yeah. And I, that's what I've been doing lately. I've been getting some killer drum sounds, huge drum sounds in small rooms, just by having the engineer walk around with it. The thing about Jane's addiction is to get them and to get me, you have to understand the whole f philosophy of wrong. <laughs> Dave, Dave's production company is called Really Wrong Productions. Really Wrong Productions. And it was my <laughs> belief that a really good rock and roll player, writer is wrong. And um, Jimi Hendrix was wrong when he came on the scene. Uh, they were all wrong. <laughs> Let's put the guitars in, so have a listen to those for a second. Wow. Just such a great, I yeah. mean, is, are you doing Nashville's in there? What, how are you getting the high against the, you get, it's like very like, there's like a lot of, yeah, well, a lot of excitement in there. Well, well yeah, there would be um, a little delay, like yeah. probably about, uh, 50 milliseconds, so it's yep. like slapping back. And then uh, um, uh, there's like amp reverb on it, which is always by itself sounds wrong, but in a track sounds good. And um, just, and Dave's playing. I mean, Dave had been, they've been doing this song live for a long time. And the Jane's Addiction, all her songs were one or two takes. It wasn't like we spent like all day and doing stuff, because that's as good as they could do. You know, I, I've worked with much better musicians, but I've had really top musicians, like I'm, I'm talking about really great players, tell me that they, that there was Tony, uh, Tony Thompson, who played on um, um, David Bowie's song, you know, and then there was uh, Tony Williams, drummer for uh, Miles Davis. Yep. They'd all say, you know, they just love this stuff because they, they, they go, it was, it was wrong. <laughs> yeah. I go, bingo. But it worked. It, it works. Worked. Yeah. So I'm going to put those three elements together, the drums, Dave's rhythm, and... Good rock. Did you ever, I, I just one other thing is, when yep. the first record I ever bought was Do You Love Me by Izzy Brothers. Right. And it was voted as the worst sounding record, rock and roll record. And it was produced by, um, uh, oh, that famous producer that does everything, uh, black producer. But anyway, he... Uh, I couldn't believe it. it voted as the worst rock and roll record, and I loved it when I was a kid because it was wrong. Those guys were just screaming into the mic, distorted. Right. It wasn't like you know, do you love me? Just all oh, you know, and they 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 come in ready for war, you know, and they. I've been now. Well, like John Lennon yeah. when he sang "Twist and Shout," you know, his voice is ripped up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like rock and roll is walking to the edge of the pier. And without hesitation, jumping off. You just don't even think about it. Anybody that, that, that sits around and has to, uh, uh, you know, 
check out every little thing about it because I believe me, I've got on my recordings, I've got a lot of feedback, blowback from people that said, you know, this band sucked or this record sucked or this, this, and they're the best selling records that I did. Of course. Because they take you to that edge someplace. Yeah. The edge so, of the pier. So here's, here's the three elements together. Absolutely amazing groove, absolutely amazing. I do want to ask you some technical stuff though. Do you remember like in those days, well firstly, which, which studio do you track this at? I tracked this at, uh, it's a place in the valley. It was um, Track Record, a very famous rock and roll studio. And uh, they, most big bands went into the big room, you know, and then I, I had, I brought my equipment and my console and stuff into a smaller room that they just had built. So, and I was renting it from them and I did, uh, you know, I did a couple albums there, but all the albums I did there sold really well. And the place had a lot of magic to it. Um, now you've got a really cool, aggressive kick and snare going on here. Is this is this uh, live, heavily EQ'd, or are you using your four out in those days? I mean, that's a really aggressive um, kick. That, it's amazing. Yeah, that sounds like a live kick. One of my live kicks. Really beautiful recording. Awesome the four act, the only thing I used on really was the snare. On the snare? Yeah. Right. Is the four act on this? You think? Probably. No. That's the live snare. I use it afterwards and not recording. That sounds like one of my live snares. You, I'll tell you how you tell my four act stuff. It has a little <laughs> on it. Yeah. It, it, it has that stuff. It doesn't have any of that stuff. Yeah. I, I know how to record drums. Oh, I know you do, yeah. <laughs> Trust I, me, I, I know you do. <laughs> I, I, and I went through hell learning how to record drums. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember the first big session I ever did and the artist came in and, and I played in the drum set and they said, God, those toms sound like bongos. I knew I had to work on my drum sound. And right. I did. I got good at it. And how I got good at it was breaking down what a drum set really is. Would you remember any details? Like, what, what pre's were you using in those days? Was that your APIs? Because um, I remember when I first worked with you in the late 90s, you had, you had tons no, of APIs no, no, and you also had tons of Summit, but the Summit probably came later. No, that was later. No, yeah. th this was, uh, there was a guy that I had a studio with, Doug Perry, and I rented equipment from him. He had a uh, rack attack, it called, and I used to rent his Neve preamps. Oh, so these were Neves? Yeah, that gives it that fat sound. Yeah, that definitely. I love, yeah, the kick is phenomenal. Inductive. That sounds like my, you know, it's just stock drum sound. Um, uh, well, your stock drum sound's amazing. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, I've done drum sounds, like when I worked with uh, Mick Jagger or worked with the Stones, uh, I, uh, I wanted to impress them, you know, so uh, who wouldn't? So my drum sounds I present to them that would be on tape were huge sounding, you know, with all the bells and whistles in on them. And so this would be like a stripped down Dave Jordan just playing. And then there's a drum sound that I had that I would print to try to really impress people. And it had huge, huge kick in stereo um, right. and, and all that stuff, you know, but it, everything was really thought out. I mean, the secret to getting a good drum sound is understanding the physics of what the drum is doing, the diameter and the depth and, uh, and the skin and all, uh, you know, what kind of skin you're gonna use on, a coated skin, whatever. And um, then after you break it down, you have to understand it's supposed to be working as one instrument. It's, it's not, you, you don't approach it with, you know, kick drum over here and snare over there. It's kick drum and snare. And I always think of it, um, a drum sound, um, you know, the, the kick starts down here. I, I start now subsonic and I just take it all the way up to where to would be right around 150 cycles and then that's where the kick starts. I mean, the kick ends and the snare starts. So you got that sitting right on top of it. There's a, there's a visual picture I've always had and the best visual picture that was ever given to me what a kick drum should sound like is you take a basketball and you hit it on cement. <laughs> if, if that's what you're going for, that will cut. Right, right. And that was the best. I always remember the, when I first ever worked with you, we were sitting down doing a pre-production meeting and you said to me, you said, I use a lot of mics. 
but don't worry, they're all in face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know something... That, that, and you told me about the, was it the 9 dB rule? Yes, the 9 dB rule. Explain far as, that to everybody. Well, if, because the drums are together and they're supposed, the toms are together, let's say, and there's a snare there, they're all in, you know, together in one space. Um, the problem is that if you get uh, a mic over here, picking up a snare over here, and you have a mic on the snare, there's going to be a discrepancy if there's too much of this tom going into this mic on the snare. It, it, there's going to be a phase problem. So how, what you do is, is, there used to be a rule called a 9 dB rule, is if you, you, you have the mic on the snare, but you're listening to the mic on the tom, and you haven't hit the snare, on the VU meter for the tom, that's not supposed to be picking up the snare, but it is, it should be 9 dB down. That way you know you're in safe territory for separation. Right, amazing. Is that 9 dB? I, I don't really use that anymore. I mean, I, I learned all those, uh, that, I, you wouldn't believe the questions I'd ask the people. You, you get, yeah, you, I asked you all the same questions. What, what, what I, <laughs> I, I tell you, the blood, sweat, and tears. I would went, believe it, because I did the same thing to you. I mean, I, I, my answers came from years of experience asking the right people. Um, I rarely, a book will get you pointed the right way. Right. But these kind of secrets, they're like uh, cook's secrets, you know, uh, yeah. the ingredients and stuff. And th it's really, a lot of people consider this like boring stuff, you know. Not me. I think it's very interesting. See, my dad uh, did recording. He, he, was, he played bass on rec recordings. He also en engineered records, too, because, you know, he... He was that kind of guy, and he taught me a lot about phase. He says it's all about phase. I said, it, 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 he said, it, and phase is all about time and separation. Right. You know? Well, it's a one amazing drum sound. The ambience on that, was that a lot to do with the room, or are you printing reverbs as well? Um, that, that would be, um, there was a room that I worked at someplace that I do a, hand, a Cherokee, they had a room for a hand clap room, it was tiled, and it sounds like that. But this might be a reverb. Um, that sound right there is not the sound of like- It's a, not the uh, raw tracks now, it's yeah, yeah, stemmed out. Yeah, there's, there's something added on there. But the, yeah. uh, but the sound I'm going for is, I imagine hand claps being uh, done in a, a tiled room, hard tile, like bathroom tile. Yeah. It, well, it's certainly got that tightness of verb on it, which I love. That's now, 30 milliseconds. Now, we, uh, there's the, the great thing about James and the great thing about you, when you're talking, we're talking you know, really wrong productions, is all of the randomness that comes into a Dave Jordan production, like yeah. this track. <laughs> all right. Well, this, this just happened to ha he, uh, Perry was going in to sing the song, and he had a dog, and his dog uh, had a toy that was yeah. in the vocal room. And Perry uh, didn't kick it out like he usually does. So he right. did, um, Annie was the dog. So, you know, it was barking. We just left. I mean, there's this, I'll tell you where that comes from. In old film, uh, and I heard this came from uh, theater too, like uh, from London theater from the 1800s. When you feel that your production needs something on the film or whatever, yeah. there's an old phrase, bring in the gorilla. <laughs> and they used to in film actually have a guy dressed up in a gorilla suit just... Yeah randomly jumping in and doing stupid stuff and never seen again with no explanation. <laughs> I bring in the gorilla. <laughs> I want to listen to a bit more of this because it's so crazy. <laughs> he just, you know, he barked on time. He auditioned for the part and he did. <laughs> auditioned and got on time. Isn't it crazy? The bongos. Now this vocal sound is... Um, is that the Ibanez, the DM-1000? He 1000? had that, but he also doubled himself like five times on right. everything. Right, Because sometimes he'd feel a, a harmony was needed. Yeah. And he would like, let, let's say this, this is the tonic, and then the first harmony would be a third up, and then the next one would be a fifth up. So when he's singing a harmony to the tonic, he may jump from the fifth to the third to the third, you know, all over the place. And then he compensates by 
naturally hitting now he understands what the other note should be, but he does them. He, he, he didn't hear the harmony separate notes at first, but by laying down that first track, he knew he could hear where the harmony parts would go. But if you asked him to stand in a room and say, sing a harmony part, Ben Costello, he couldn't do it. But I, it was one of the craziest phenomena I ever seen. No, I, I asked you about this like 20 years ago. You probably don't remember. We were, and that's quite all right. I asked you about harmonies and you said to me, Oh, just let the singer go in there and just do full takes and let them try out ideas yeah. and figure it out afterwards, which was really good advice because at that time I was working with the singer and I was trying to tell them harmonies and they no, could never get work. it. Either they can do it or they can't. And um, I mean, it, it helps to have them listen to records that they like that have harmonies on it too. Yeah. And then um, go in and try to duplicate that, you know, just... You can record it or not record it, because the idea of what a harmony should be. But trying to teach music on the spot to somebody is a waste of time. Right, and I, I remember, I can't remember whose line it was. It's like, not all, good, not, all ba not all good background singers make good lead singers, and lead singers don't always make good ba background that's, that's singers. That's yeah. true. It's a, technique is everything. You know, background singers sing airy, whatever that would be. Sing hard, whatever that would be. And it means something totally different to a lead singer. You sing airy and they're going to do something that's not what you had in mind, you know, but uh, right. you're right. Back, I mean, if you put a, um, a lead singer into an ensemble, just singing one of his songs, they could sing the harmonies and do it, but bringing him in as like a high session player, you know. Yeah, I agree. Fantastic. So there's so much cool stuff on this. Let's go! You got some panning percussion there. Right. He's singing stack like that also. It's a little out of time and everything when he's shouting. It sounds like a crowd. And you get a feeling it's just supposed to be fun and get into it or, or go die. Do you remember what vocal mic? Huh? Would you remember what vocal mic you used on that? Uh, was it 67? No, it wasn't 67 for sure. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I, it might have been a C12, but... Um, I always wonder with Perry whether, whether he had to hold a mic to sing. Well, there was... There, with singers like... No, but there, there are a lot of singers, punk singers especially, but what I do with singers that don't have any mic technique is I'll give them 57 to sing into. And I'll record it, but I'll also have, um, you know, a, a more of an ambient mic up here and maybe a better mic, you know, that's more directional coming yeah. here. But I've had to do that with a lot of things. Mick Jagger is the guy I had to do it with because his technique of singing is totally backwards, which he needed because he did all those 60s tours and with bad stuff. So. In the studio, when you want to get live, you back up so you don't blow the mic out. He, to him, you get you get it louder so you come up on the mic, you know. Yeah. So a lot of uh, singers that don't know have any technique will do that. Perry, would, I don't remember having any big problems with Perry. Um, one thing that I knew he was going to be doing was he was going to be doing a lot of stacking, and I want to make sure I'm catching it right. So I got the mic, so you know I got the coverage, and. Um, he, yeah, it's, it's just make, making sure you get coverage on the thing and you're not blowing out the uh, the equipment. Like guys like Perry, Mick J, a lot of people like that that come from punk era or hard singing. I'll put double compression on them. Right. right. You know, I'll put I'll uh, it with really fast uh, you know attack time and uh, and and a long release time. You know, so you know it just gives more body to the thing. You know, it's going to last longer. And um, 
But Perry, I don't remember having, there. I mean, there's some singers I could talk about that, you know, were terrible to record with and hard to record with, but um, Perry was not one of them. No, I mean, I, Perry I, takes correction. I tell you, Perry takes, you know, he, he had kind of this, the image of being kind of a smart ass. Well, he's a very smart guy. He's he very is a smart, smart guy, guy. But, but, but kind of a kind of class. He's every, against everything, you right. know, and you think he's going to, you know, it's funny, I worked with, um, um, a singer from PIL, uh, Johnny, Johnny Lydon, Johnny Rotten, and, and Perry, and, and Mick, uh, um, what's his face from the Stones, uh, Keith, and all of them have this image of being, you know, assholes pretty much. And these guys I just mentioned are the nicest guys to work with. Yeah. They're serious about the recording and they want to learn. You know, it's saying like Keith, for instance, he's done a lot more recording than I have. But if I suggest something, he would do it. Well, this is this is an amazing track. What I love about it is there's no, um, how can I put this? There's no like trickery to it. It's a groove the right. whole time. That's what it's all about. It's a groove. It, it takes you, it, it, you'd never get bored the whole time. There's stuff of interest. But just the first time you hear it, and it's that. It's, 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 like, it's, it's like a Mexican record, you know? Mexican records are very simple, but it's all a groove, you know? I love it. What, did you mix this on the SSL? Yeah. And when, uh, where did you mix it? Uh, Soundcastle. Wonderful. On uh, the planet Mars. Soundcastle, <laughs> the planet Mars. The capital of Mars. The capital of Mars. The Soundcastle, it's like Silver Lake, isn't it? It's like kind of Glendale, yeah, yeah, Silver Lake area. Yeah. So you, you're mixing at Soundcastle. Yep. Um, what did they have? They had a 4,000? They, they had a 4,000 uh, and a 9,000 in another room. And um, what, what I determined was... Like the 4,000 is really good for harsh, for like in your face. And the 4,000 was better for like vocals and things like that. It, it has more tone to it. It, it has a curve of an eve. Um, so um, it's a wider, wider uh, you know, what do they call that thing? Um, Q, it's a wider right. cue and, and you can pick up more with it. But, but um, I'm mixing a studio now that has in one board uh, 4,000 and a 9,000. And it's a hundred input board, and Crazy. with, with that, that thing, I can I, I have a lot of fun with it. You know, and I, I've been uh, buying equipment to use in that stereo compressors and stuff because I got so much room I can do the craziest tricks that I want. Were you when you mixing this song? Were you using any external EQs or compression, or were you mainly using just the SSL? No, no, just the uh, SSL for compression. Each channel has this great compression on the SSL 4000. It, it, um, it almost sounds it sounds like it hitting so hard. It sounds like it's sucking, you know. You know, so uh, I love the uh, for drums. The four thousand EQ is great. Lot lot of famous. You know, the, when those boards first came on the scene, there were so many engineers that put them down. You know, it was Neve versus SSL, and but all the hits were being mixed on SSL mm -hmm. in the early eighties. You know. So any other any other little tidbits you can we can sort of add any other memories of being caught stealing. Um, when I first heard this song, I didn't think that it would blow up to be the song that it is, but it turned out because, you know, we had a hard time getting the groove and all that stuff, but it just merged into a really fun song. It's one of my favorites, of course. I mean, who can not like this song? And the video it's was amazing. Great. Oh, the video is hilarious. It's yeah. so much fun. Well, Perry's bit dancing. He looks like uh, uh, Nosferatu, you know, yeah. <laughs> vampire coming down the I, yeah, it's just the everything moment. about this. For me, it just like hit on so many levels because you're sitting in England and you see this video and hear this song. And, you know, we, we had like, I suppose at that period, it was probably like Happy Mondays, Stone Roses. Those were the big bands. Right. And they were more dance orientated. And most of the mainstream music we were getting from America at that time was more like big 80s rock. Right. And then suddenly this song, what, 1990? See, yeah, we did, Perry and I hated that big, uh, that the arena rock, big hair arena rock thing that was happening. It was so overdone. It was like, come on. I mean, when when it first came out with Aerosmith, would it say, or something, you know, but come on, like 10 years later and, and people are still going for the same everything, you know, and it's, come on, move on. I mean, the thing about music is it's a great way to express yourself, not to copy somebody. Totally. Well, fantastic. Thank you ever so much. You're welcome. Dave, you rock.
We're going to do another song, so stay tuned for a later video. This is not going to be only one. Of course, if there's any comments and questions, please leave them below. Dave, you've, I've learned so much from you, it's insane. This next one is where I'm on acid. <laughs> I'm just starting, it's just starting to kick it's in. It's just starting to kick in. <laughs> 